The history of the Jewish people, intricately intertwined with the history of Russia, is an epic filled with deep tragedies and astonishing twists. Let's recall the end of the 19th century, when over 80% of all Jews in the world found their home across the vast expanses of the Russian Empire. Having endured centuries of trials in Rus, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, the Russian Empire and the USSR, the history of Jews is replayed with moments of deprivation of rights, deportations and, alas, tragedies. Modern Russia, where anti-Semitism is officially banned at the legislative level, still encounters its shadows in public consciousness. The recent pogroms in Dagestan in October 2023 are a stark and sad example of this. But there are bright pages in this story as well. Russia attempted to create an alternative Israel in its Far East, resulting in the creation of the Jewish Autonomous Region. Moreover, the Soviet Union was one of the first countries to grant extensive rights to Jews after the Communist Revolution in 1917. Today, I invite you on a journey through this captivating and multifaceted history of Jews in Russia, a story filled with sorrow and hope, loss and restoration. How did Jews end up in Rus? The first Jewish communities might have appeared in the land of modern Russia and Ukraine as early as the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. These were primarily Jews living in Greek colonies along the shores of the Black Sea, traders and travelers crossing the waters of the Great Silk Road who decided to settle in these lands. It is also known that a significant number of Jews lived in Bosporan Kingdom as early as the 2nd of the 4th century. In the 7th century, the Taman Peninsula was a major center of Jewish concentration. This is mentioned by the Byzantine chronicler Theophanes who wrote it in the year 671. In the city of Panagoria and its surroundings, near the Jews living there, many other tribes also dwell. Some Palestinian Jews from Persia migrated to the lower Volga region where in the 8th century the city of Itzil emerged, the capital of the Khazar Haganate. As it known, one of the religions of the Khazar Haganate in the second half of the 8th century to the beginning of the 9th century became Judaism, which obviously took root there under the influence of the Jewish communities. After the collapse of the Khazar Haganate, Jews were forced to immigrate westward. This is confirmed by the Chronicles of 1117 about the resettlement of the Khazars to Chernigov. The beginning of problems and the first prohibitions. In the 12th century, many Jews historically lived in the territories of Kiev and Chernigov. However, with Christianization of Rus and the introduction of Byzantine Christianity, a period of anti-Semitism began. Jewish merchants from Poland and Lithuania who came for trade faced restrictions. The Moscow Tsars prohibited them from settling on Russian lands. Early Roots of Anti-Semitism in Rus Historian Vasily Tatishev described that the struggle against Jews began as early as the time of Vladimir Monomach. Thus, already in the 12th century, a law was issued in Rus, prescribing the expulsion of all Jews from the territory of Rus and prohibiting the subsequent return. Ivan the Terrible and his policies during the time of Ivan the Terrible, the attitude toward Jews worsened. Ivan the Terrible, known for his cruel methods of governance, introduced strict measures against Jews. In 1545, in Moscow, goods belonging to Jewish merchants from Lithuania were burned, causing an international scandal. Polish King Sigismund II Augustus sent a protest to Ivan the Terrible, mentioning the freedom of trade between countries. But Ivan the Terrible responded by accusing the Jews of promoting apostasy from Christianity and bringing harmful substances into Russia. We have repeatedly written to you before, informing you of wicked deeds of the Jews, how they led our people away from Christianity, brought poisonous potions into our state and did many other harms to our people. We cannot allow Jews to travel to our state as we don't want to see any harm here. And we want God to allow my people in my state to live in peace without any disturbance. And you, our brother, should not write to us about the Jews anymore. Ivan the Terrible was convinced that Jews posed a threat to both the Orthodox faith and the state as a whole. Foreign traveler Petre described Ivan's cruelty towards the Jews, pointing to his rejections of their religious beliefs and reluctance to accept Christianity. No matter how cruel and fierce he was, he did not persecute or hate anyone except the Jews, who did not want to be baptized and profess Christ. He either burned them alive, hanged them or threw them into the water. The Livonian War was one of the most tragic episodes in the history of Jews in Rus. In 1563, after the capture of Polotsk by Russian forces, Ivan the Terrible ordered the baptism of all the Jews in the city, threatening to drown those who refused. Despite the religious aspect, the main reason for the persecutions of Jews was economic. Ivan the Terrible saw Jews as competitors to Russian merchants and potential threat to the economical well-being of his state. 
Peter the Great. At the beginning of the era of Peter the Great, in the early 18th century, when Russia embarked on the path of modernization, the attitude towards Jews slightly improved. A new layer of Jews emerged who converted from Judaism to Orthodox Christianity. They were called Vikristi. The Vikristi were allowed to settle anywhere, many of them worked as doctors, translators, and icon painters. Peter the Great introduced a group of Vikristi into the higher echelons of Russian aristocracy. Baptized Jews included Vice Chancellor Safirov, the ambassador in Amsterdam and Vienna, Vajnitsyn, and the general police maester of St. Petersburg, Divier. However, Peter the Great constantly rejected the entry request of non-baptized Jewish merchants into Russia, probably not wishing to exacerbate his already tense relationship with the Orthodox Church. Nonetheless, it was during the Peter the Great's reign that Jews began to penetrate various spheres of life in the Russian Empire. After Peter the Great. However, this did not last long. After the death of Peter the Great, his wife, Catherine II, issued a decree to expel all Jews from the empire's borders. Later, Peter the Great's daughter, Elizabeth Petrovna, ordered the expulsion of only those Jews who refused to convert to Christianity. She referred to the Jews as the murderers of Jesus Christ. In 1743, the Senate asked Elizabeth Petrovna to allow unbaptized Jews to come to Russia from Poland and Lithuania for trading and fairs, to which Elizabeth Petrovna responded, from the enemies of Christ, I don't desire profit. The partition of the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Until 1772, the Jewish population in Russia was virtually non-existent. Efforts to prevent Jews from entering the Russian Empire proved futile, as the land of the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, with their numerous Jewish population, became part of the Russian Empire at the end of the 18th century following its partitions from 1772 to 1795. From this point, the religious and ideological problem of Russian authorities' attitudes toward Jews turned into a practical one. Professor Shmuel Ettinger from the Haber University of Jerusalem writes, The partition of Poland between Russia, Austria and Prussia entailed severe upheals in the life of the Jewish population. They were involved in the leasing of agricultural lands and at one time dominated in small and medium credit lending, and were very active in all kinds of trade. In some areas, for example in clothing repair, Jewish craftsmen were almost monopolists. In the medieval world, this caused negative attitudes among Christian neighbors. By the time of the partitions of Poland, the economical influence of Jews had greatly diminished, especially in finance, but the enduring perception of Jews as exploiters dominated in public consciousness. Catherine the Great and placing Jews in the merchant class. Immediately after the partition of Poland at the end of the 18th century, Catherine the Great inspired by the idea of growing cities at the trade centers of the Russian Empire, in 1780 issued a decree classifying all Jews as part of the merchant class. Compared to most of the population, who were part of the peasant class, the merchant class had broader rights and privileges. Simultaneously, Catherine the Great issued another decree, the so-called city regulations for the residents of Moscow. It granted greater privileges to the merchant class regardless of religion, whether Christian or Judaist. And guess who was almost universally enrolled in this very merchant class? Correct, the Jews. By 1790, in Moscow, there were three merchants of the first guild, essentially millionaires in modern terms, and all of them were Jews. Asil Yankilevich, Mikhail Gersh Mendel, and Gersh Israelev. As noted by Professor John Clear of University College London, the status of Russian Jews was unique for that time in all of Europe. However, this state of affairs did not last long, facing discontent from the Christian urban population and accusations by authorities of Jews engaging in parasitic and exploitative activities, not conductive to the growth of cities and not corresponding to the activities of the merchant class. Statesman Gavriil Derjavin, believing that Jews hated Christians, proposed prohibiting Jews from hiring Christian servants banning exile Jewish criminals in Siberia from taking their wives with them, so as not to proliferate and corrupt the heart of the empire, as he said, breaking the power of the Kahals, local Jewish organizations, so that Jews could fully participate in the economic life of the society skipping Kahals, destroying the old Jewish system of communal self-government with its own taxes, collections and fines, and at the same time prohibiting Jews from being elected to estate bodies, thus leaving all decisions about Jews in the hands of Christian competitors, as well as destroying the right to engage in wine trading and leasing. The stereotype of Jewish exploitation was a cornerstone of Russian state policy towards Jews. Its manifestations in the form of various restrictions on permitted occupations, 
place of residence and others, combined with the growth of Jewish population, led to its mass impoverishment. Like all other Russian subjects of taxable estates, Jews did not enjoy full freedom in choosing their place of residence. A decree by Catherine II dated December 28, 1791, defined the territory where they were allowed to reside and engage in commerce, later known as the Pale of Settlement. As historian Johann Petrovsky Stern writes, the Pale of Settlement represented a crucial mechanism for violating the elementary rights of Jews in Russia. Indeed, by the order of Catherine the Great, Jews were allowed to settle in only 5% of the territory of the whole Russian Empire. But even within the Pale of Settlement, Jews were not allowed to settle everywhere. They were evicted from cities and villages and allowed to settle only in specific shtelts, small villages specifically allocated for Jews. Moreover, Jews were prohibited from engaging in many types of activities because, in the opinion of the state, this bankrupted the local peasants. Such activities included leasing mills, dairy farms, and fishing. This prohibition immediately excluded from the economical life and industry that fed almost half of the Jewish population of the Russian Empire. In 1794, the main tax, the poll tax for Jews who registered in the merchant and townsfolk class, was set at double rate compared to the tax on Christian merchants and townsfolk. Thus, Jews were also taxed twice as much as Christians. In 1797, special positions of censors of Jewish books were introduced. They had to thoroughly study books on Hebrew and Yiddish and exclude from them those parts that could be considered a tax on Christianity. Censors bore personal responsibility for approved books. To address the Jewish question until 1881, the authorities pursued a consistent policy of assimilation and integration. Historian John Clear writes, the state and society agreed that Jews could and should be transferred into a healthy force in the society. Under Alexander I, the states codified the legal regulations of the status of Jews. The decree reflected both restrictions and prohibitions, as well as the rights of Jews in economical life to stimulate more productive economical activity among the Jewish population. The decree of December 9, 1804, allowed Jews in Russia to join the peasant class to establish agricultural settlements or so-called colonies on specifically designated uninhabited lands in Novorossiya province, which are basically the modern territories of eastern Ukraine. Like other colonists, Jews received temporary tax benefits, exemptions from the military service, and subsidies from acquiring or purchasing land. The time of partition of Poland was a time of religious schism among Polish Jews. The Hasidism were especially numerous in Ukraine. In most cities, Jewish communities consisted of both elements. Hasidism and their opponents called misnagdoms. Alexander I established a special committee to discuss the issue of improving the living conditions of Jews in Russia and in 1804 approved the regulation of arrangement of Jews developed by this committee. This legislative act legalized the religious schism among Jews. In each community, Hasidic Jews and Mitnagdim Jews were allowed to set up their special synagogues and elect their rabbis, provided that the Kahal administration in each city was common to all parts of the community. For about 20 years, Jewish people lived relatively well under the rule of Alexander I, until he entered the phase of his reign when he began to believe that everyone around him was trying to kill him. This led to renewed persecutions of Jews. Jewish people. By January 1824, about 20,000 Jews had been evicted, many of whom were left homeless and wandered the roads. In 1824, another decree was issued. Jews who were subjects of foreign states were forbidden to settle in Russia. The government justified it as necessary to put an end to, as they said, extraordinary proliferation of the Jewish race. In 1825, under the pretext of combating smuggling, Jews were forbidden to live in the countryside in the 50-kilometer zone along the border. In 1825, Alexander I died and was succeeded by Nicholas I. During the reign of Nicholas I, in 1827, a law was enacted requiring Jews to fulfill military obligations, from which they had been previously been exempt. Unlike Christians, Jews were recruited from the age of 12. Jewish child recruits under 18 were sent to Cantonese battalions, which are military schools. The years spent at Cantonese battalions were not counted towards the mandatory 25 years of military service required for both Jews and non-Jews. The requirement quote for Jewish communities was 10 recruits per 1,000 men annually, while for Christians it was only 7 per 1,000 every other year. During the reign of Nicholas I, 
Laws were also enacted limiting the rights of Jewish people to choose their residence and occupation. On December 2, 1827, decrees were published about the eviction of Jews from rural area in Grodno province and from Kiev. In 1829, Nicholas I ordered the expulsion of all Jews from Kurland who had come from other places. In 1835, the emperor approved a new regulation on Jewish law. According to it, in Belarus, Jews were allowed to live only in cities in Little Russia, everywhere except Kiev and state-owned villages, in Novorossiya, in all settlements except Nikolaev and Sevastopol, in the inner provinces, Jews were allowed to visit for no more than six weeks with passports issued by governors on the conditions of wearing Russian clothing, not Jewish. In 1844, Nicholas I banned Jews from government services because he was not sure if they will follow the Russian laws and not their own ones. In Moscow, from 1828 to 1856, visiting Jewish merchants were allowed to reside only in the Glebovska courtyard without the right to leave it at night and from Friday evening to Saturday evening. From 1838 to 1847, 3,049 Jews temporarily resided in Glebovska courtyard. In June 1856, Jews were allowed to settle throughout Moscow, but some Jews remained living in the Glebovska courtyard. On May 1, 1850, a ban was imposed on wearing traditional Jewish clothing. After January 1, 1851, only elderly Jews were allowed to wear it, subject to paying the corresponding tax. Kippos and yarmulkes could only be worn in synagogues. In November 1851, all Jewish population was divided into five categories – merchants, farmers, craftsmen, Jews who had property, and those who had none. Most of the Jewish population fell into the last category who owned no property. For them, an intensified military recruitment was introduced. They were forbidden to leave the cities to which they were assigned. The regulations also mentioned sending these Jews to mandatory state work. Mandatory military service, increasing taxes and various persecutions led to the impoverishment of the broad layers of the Jewish population. In 1827, debts from Jews amounted to 1 ruble per person and in 1854 to 15 rubles and 50 kopecks per person, which is 15 times more. However, Nicholas I also gave Jews the opportunity to purchase land in certain regions, reduce taxes and recruitment obligations for Jews in these regions too. In other words, he simply wanted to resettle Jews in an uninhabited lands so they would settle far away from Russians. With the Emperor Alexander II coming to power, who gained fame in Russian Empire as one of the most liberal and enlightened emperors, relaxation for Jews began to appear. In 1856, Jewish children were no longer compulsorily taken into Cantonist units. Certain categories of Jews were allowed to live outside the Pale of Settlement, but not all. Only people with higher education, guild craftsmen, and retired recruits from the army. In June 1856, Jews in Moscow were allowed to live beyond the Glebovska courtyard, the only previously permitted residency for Jews in Moscow. Finally, they could settle wherever they wanted. In the new law on local governments, there were finally no restrictions for Jews. However, not everything was so rosy, because in 1870, in cities, a bill was passed restricting the number of Jews occupying places in local self-governments should not exceed one-third. Moreover, in 1866, Alexander II again prohibited Jews from buying land for agricultural purposes. Alexander II's reign is famous for rapid economical growth. Jewish entrepreneurs played a significant role in that economical growth. The sugar industry grew rapidly thanks to the major Jewish entrepreneurs Zaitsev and Brodsky. The city of Odessa developed very quickly as a major port thanks to the largest Jewish community in the entire Russian Empire. Jews also penetrated the cultural life of the empire. The artist Isaac Leviathan, the sculptor Mark Antokolsky, and the composer Anton Rubinstein became well known. From the 1860s, the isolation of Jews in the country became weaker. A great number of Jews adopted the Russian language and customs. Jewish youth aspired to enter schools and universities. There was a generational split. The younger generation wanted to assimilate with Russian culture, while the older generation refused this and adhered to cultural isolationism. In 1879, Jews received the right to enter government service and courts for the first time. In the 1860s, even Jewish books in Russian appeared. Later, in the 1880s, the literary activity of Shalom Aleichem, the most famous Jewish writer of the Russian Empire, began. I once even lived on Shalom Aleichem Street in the city of Birebijan, 
Today, only three streets are named after Shalom Aleichem, one in the Russian city of Berbejan and two in Ukraine, in Kiev and Dnipro. In the 19th century, 69,400 Jews converted to Orthodox Christianity, 12,000 to Catholicism, mainly in the Kingdom of Poland, which was occupied by the Russian Empire, and about 3,000 to Lutheranism. Alexander II's reforms began the integration of Jews into Russian society and the creation of a class of Jewish intelligentsia. However, many reforms were half-hearted, laying the groundwork for the activation of anti-Semitic sentiments in Russian society, as Jews were still considered unequal to the rest of the Russian society. However, anti-Semitism in the empire still persisted. Pogroms, the Russian word for raids of Jewish settlements, continued to occur. In 1871, during the Jewish pogrom in Odessa, Jews made their first attempt at self-defense. The police prohibited Jews from creating self-defense units and pursued the participants, arresting 150 Jewish people. In March 1881, Alexander II was assassinated by members of the revolutionary Narodna Voda movement, among whom were many Jews. Historian Dmitry Lavaisky was one of the first to suggest that Poles and Jews were behind the revolutionary movements in the Russian Empire. The assassination of Alexander II led to the start of pogroms in 166 cities and villages. Thousands of Jewish homes were destroyed, many Jewish were wounded or killed, the authorities did not interfere with pogroms, there were rumors of government directives to beat Jews. One rumor claimed that Alexander III, the son of Alexander II, allowed revenge on Jews for his father's murder. The murder of his father drew Alexander's third extensive attention to the Jewish question. Historian Pyotr Zainchkovsky noted Alexander III's zoological hatred of Jewish people. The emperor was opposed to any improvement in the status of Jewish people, profoundly believing that if their fate is sad, it is predestined by the gospel. Repressive laws against Jews were quick to follow. Jews were prohibited from settling in rural areas, from acquiring property outside loud areas, from renting land, and from trading on Sundays and Christian holidays. In 1887, Jews living in villages were forbidden to move from one village to another. Writer Mikhail Sterenches called this a kind of serfdom for Jews. All these rules were only abolished in 1917, during the revolution. In 1887, Alexander III also established quota limits for Jewish enrollment in gymnasiums and universities. 10% within the Pale of Settlement, 5% outside the Pale, and only 3% in the capitals. In 1889, Jews were no longer allowed to serve as Jewry members. In 1890, Jews were forbidden from participating in local government. Furthermore, the state organized a monopoly on the production and sale of alcoholic products. Many Jewish families who had been involved in this business for centuries went bankrupt. The shock of the pogroms, a new wave of restrictions, and delusionment with the Russian society's attitude towards Jews contributed to many Jewish people joining the revolutionary movement. In the Narodnaya Volya movement that killed Alexander II, only 5% of the members were Jews. But after Alexander III's delegatory policy towards Jews, the percentage of Jewish people in the revolutionary movement rose to 40%. That is, 40% of the entire revolutionary movement were Jews. Socialist ideas were gaining popularity among Jewish youth. In 1897, the illegal socialist organization Bund was created, which later joined one of the first socialist all-Russian organizations, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. In the future, the Communist Party that ruled the USSR. A significant portion of the generations of Jews who grew up under Alexander's third rule began to reject the idea of assimilation with the Russian people and to support Zionism more. The Hovavay Zion movement was created. The movement laid the foundation for the first Aliyah, so-called the first major wave of repatriation of the Jewish people to the land of Palestine. The first Russian population census took place in 1897. According to its data, there were 5,110,548 Jews living in the Russian Empire. They constituted 4.03% of the entire population of European Russia. Jews made up 14% of the population of Poland under Russian rule. In Belarus and Lithuania, Jews comprised 50% of the urban population and in Ukraine, 30%. The census also revealed that the Jewish population in the Russian Empire had grown 6.7 times from 1795 
1897. In 1795, the Jewish population in Russia was only about 750,000 people, while by the end of 1897, the Jewish population in Russia grew to 5 million and 216,000 of people. Such growth rates, namely 1.9% per year, were unparalleled by any other ethnicity in Russia. At the end of the 18th century, Jews were the ninth largest ethnic group in Russia, following the Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians, Tatars and Finns. However, by the early 20th century, they had become the fifth largest, surpassing Finns, Lithuanians, Latvians and Tatars. By the end of the 19th century, the average life expectancy for Jews were 39 years for Bashkirs 37.3 and for Russians only 28.7 years. Jews assimilated slowly. By 1897, only 1.4% of all Jewish people recognized Russian language as their native language, while for 97.9% it was Yiddish that was their native language. What were the Jews engaged in according to 1897 census? Well, 43.6% of Jews were small craftsmen, 14.4% were tailors and seamstresses, 6.6% were carpenters, 3.1% were locksmiths, and the rest were involved in trade and other undefined activities. Following the death of Alexander III, whose stance towards Jewish people was predominantly negative, he was succeeded by his son, Nicholas II, the last emperor of the Russian Empire. It was during the reign of Nicholas II that the most notorious Jewish pogrom in the Russian Empire occurred, the Kishinev pogrom in April 1903. This pogrom was triggered by rumors of Jewish involvement in the ritual murder of a 14-year-old boy. As a result, 50 Jews were killed and about 600 were injured. The authorities displayed a permissive attitude, failing to intervene to stop the violence and indirectly encouraging it. The Kishinev pogrom sparked outrage among the Russian intelligentsia. Consequently, in April 1903, Nicholas II permitted Jews to live in a larger number of towns, adding 101 settlements to the least where Jews were allowed to reside. However, Jews were still prohibited from acquiring property in rural areas. From 1904 to 1905, 30,000 Jews participated in the Russo-Japanese War. In recognition of their service, Nicholas II allowed soldiers and their families to settle anywhere in the Russian Empire. Jewish wives with higher education also gained the right to purchase property and leave anywhere. Nevertheless, the concessions of Alexander II and Nicholas II towards Jewish rights, it did not halt the mass migration from the Russian Empire. Moreover, widespread pogroms, discriminatory laws and the state's anti-Jewish policies did not encourage Jews to remain in the Russian Empire. Between 1881 and 1914, 1.98 million of Jewish people left the Russian Empire. Of those who left during this period, 78.6% or precisely 1,557,000 of Jews immigrated to the USA. Only a few went to Palestine, Argentina and other countries. Bracha Lichtenberg Ettinger, an Israeli writer, notes that widespread Jewish immigration began with the flight from the horrors of the pogroms. The discrimination faced by many Jews presented them with a choice – immigration or participation in the revolutionary movement. Jewish immigration was even supported by the authorities. During a trial in Kiev involving participants in a Jewish pogrom, the prosecutor stated, If the eastern border is closed to Jews, the western border is open. Why don't they use it? This was echoed in an interview with the Jewish magazine Rasvet by the Minister of the Interior Ignatiev, who said, The Western border is open for Jews. Russian Jews form the core of those who created the State of Israel. The immigration to Eretz Israel began from Russia with the first Aliyah from 1882 to 1903, comprising about 25,000 people from Russia. Then, until 1923, an additional 75,000 of people from Russia moved to Palestine. We know that the founding fathers and mothers, including Golda Meir, First Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and the First President Haim Weissman, they were all from Russia. So were the second president Ben Zvi and other notable figures, also called Russian Jews. In the early 20th century, the social structure of Jews looked like this. 15% were proletarians, 10% were employees, 2.2% were peasants, 
1% were in the army and 35% were engaged in business, and the rest is unknown. Many Jews joined the revolutionary parties of the Socialist Revolutionaries and the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which later would become the Communist Party. Social Democratic Labour Party split into two wings, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Both founders and leaders of the Menshevik faction, Julius Martov and Pavel Axelrod, were Jews. Jews actively participated in the revolution of 1905 and 1907. During this period, there were 660 pogroms with more than 800 Jews killed. In 1905, the state granted autonomy to universities and universities began to admit Jewish students disregarding the percentage quota stated by law. However, in 1908, the Council of Ministers reintroduced the quota not only in all universities but also in all state institutions. The number of Jews in the government service was not to exceed 15% in the Pale of Settlement, 10% in the internal regions and 5% in Moscow and St. Petersburg. In 1911, the Jewish Literary Society was closed because Minister of the Internal Affairs Stalipin tried to ban national movements and assimilate people into the Russian Empire. In the early 20th century, important changes occurred in the law. Previously, discriminatory restrictions applied only if you were a Jew practicing Judaism, meaning you could simply convert to Orthodox Christianity and have all restrictions lifted. Now, it didn't matter what religion you believed in, the discriminatory laws applied to you too. Jewishness began to be defined by ethnic criteria. Now, being a baptized Jew, you could not become an army officer, for example. Even if your grandfather was baptized and your father and you were baptized, you were still not considered a full Christian and restrictions would apply to you. During World War I, a huge number of Jewish people served in the Russian army. By 1916, there were 600 Jewish soldiers in the army. Among the officers, there were no unbaptized Jews. During the war, Jews were often accused of sympathizing with Germany. Russian forces occupied Galicia and reported that the local Jews were openly hostile to the Russian army. When the Austro-Hungarian forces advanced, the retreating Russian army transported Jews on freight trains from Galicia to the mainland Russia. It was mandatory for all Jewish people living there. So Russia was always ahead of the entire planet, starting to transport Jews on freight trains 25 years before the Nazis did. In the first two years in the First World War, from 250,000 to 350,000 Jews were forcibly brought from the territories of Poland, Lithuania and Belarus to the internal provinces of Russia. This was explained by the alleged disloyalty of Jews and their assistance to the enemy in the frontline territories. They were given just 24 hours to pack their belongings and the remaining property was usually looted by the soldiers. Although they were evicted from their homes and lands, this effectively abolished the Pale of Settlement rule. The prohibition on Jews living remained only in Moscow, Petrograd, which is St. Petersburg, and several other territories, as well as in resorts where the royal family rested. During World War I, many Jews were baselessly suspected of espionage. Many were killed by decisions of military field courts. Historian Oleg Butnitsky wrote, Although the command of the Russian army bore full responsibility for the anti-Semitic policy carried out since the beginning of the war, nevertheless it is evident that anti-Semitism was deeply rooted in the masses. Nobel laureate in literature Boris Pasternak wrote about the plight of Jews in World War I. What a cup of suffering the unfortunate Jewish population has drunk in this war. It is conducted right within the bounds of the Air Force settlement. And for what they have learned and suffered, the extortions and devastations, they are additionally paid with pogroms, ridicule and accusations of insufficient patriotism. But where should the patriotism come from when they enjoy all the rights with the enemy, but here they are all subjects to persecutions? The hatred towards them is basis is contradictory. The February Revolution of 1917 drastically changed the situation of Jews in Russia. The provisional government sought to equalize the rights of all citizens, lifting all restrictions on Jews. For the first time in history, Jews held high positions in the state administration. For example, Grigory Schrader became the mayor of Petrograd, Osip Minor headed the city Duma in Moscow, and Leon Trotsky became the chairman of the Petrograd Soviet. The political freedoms brought by the February Revolution allowed Jews to create political associations, notably intensifying the Zionist movement. From only 18,000 of active members of the Zionist movement in 1915, by May 1917, their number had increased to 140,000 people. 
A United Jewish Socialist Workers' Party was formed, primarily aiming to create Jewish autonomy within Russia. That was a flourishing of Jewish culture. The Zionist society Tarbut established about 250 educational organizations, including schools and kindergartens, where teaching was conducted exclusively in Hebrew. The first theater in Hebrew was opened in Moscow in those times. In 1917, there were 50 Jewish publications in Russian and at least 39 newspapers in Yiddish. In October 1917, the Bolsheviks overthrew the provisional government in a coup, known as the October Revolution. Moreover, a lot of Jewish organizations in the southern Russia financially supported the White Army, intending to restore the monarchy. In December 1917, the Jewish bourgeoisie of Rostov-on-Don collected 800 thousands of rubles to supply Cossacks units to fighting against the Bolsheviks. One of them said, better to save Russia with Cossacks than with Bolsheviks. However, the majority of Jews sympathized with Bolsheviks, partly because two Jews, Leon Trotsky and Isaac Steinberg, who joined the Bolsheviks government. The Bolsheviks promised equal rights for all, including Jews. The Bolshevik Party had a significant number of Jewish people. In the Central Committee of Russian Social Democratic Labour Party of Bolsheviks, out of 21 members, six were Jews. Zinovnev, Kamenev, Trotsky, Sverdlov, Uritsky and Sokolnikov. With the Bolsheviks in power, Jews played an active role in the political life of Russia at that time. Jews created a central bureau of Jewish communities to coordinate the work of Jewish organizations and lay the foundation for Jewish national autonomy. Unaware at the time, Stalin would establish this Jewish autonomy only 20 years later, but the reality would be harsher than the Jews' dreams of their own land. Soviet Jews also discriminated against Jews who converted to Christianity during the Empire era. In the elections of the Central Bureau of Jewish Communities, only practicing Judaism Jews had the right to vote. For the first time in the Russian history, ordinary Jews could elect their representatives through elections. They even formed different political parties, such as the Conservative Jewish Party and the Socialist Jewish Workers' Party. However, ironically, soon after the elections, the Bolsheviks banned these Jewish political organizations, seeing them as a threat to their power. The Bolsheviks began closing almost all independent Jewish political organizations and arresting the most active Jewish politicians. To placate the Jews, the Bolsheviks established the Evsektsia, departments dealing with Jewish issues within the Bolsheviks' party. The Evsektsias were created in regions with a larger Jewish population, particularly in the communist parties of Ukraine and Belarus. Their primary goal was to assimilate Jews into the new Soviet citizenry based on revolutionary proletarian ideas. The Bolsheviks, as staunch enemies of religion, began banning Judaism, promoting Yiddish over Hebrew, and stating, religion must be completely excluded from Jewish national schools. The Evsektsia also aimed to combat bourgeois habits among Jewish people people, many of whom had been traitors in the Russian Empire. The February Revolution, the October Revolution and the Civil War created conditions for new pogroms. During the Civil War and the German-Austrian occupation of Ukraine from 1918 to 1920, about 50,000 Jews were killed, according to the International Red Cross. The enemies of the Bolsheviks, especially the White Army, perceived Soviet power as Jewish rule. The Southern Volunteer Army published anti-Semitic newspapers and leaflets, deliberately exaggerating the number of Jews in the Soviet Army. Kolchak's army stated, Drive out the Jewish commissars come from Russia. The Southern Volunteer Army even dismissed all Jewish officers. Due to such treatment, many Jewish soldiers left the White Army, with some joining the Red Army. During the Civil War, parts of the White Army organized 296 pogroms in 267 settlements, killing 5,235 Jews. The same rules applied to Jews in the areas occupied by the Whites as in the Russian Empire. Quota systems were introduced in schools and universities. It should be noted that the Reds also occasionally organized pogroms, but their participants were usually punished and often executed. This led many Jews to lean towards supporting the Reds. Many Jewish youth joined the Red Army, with entire units consisting solely of Jews, such as the 1st Jewish Regiment. During the Civil War, approximately 100,000 Jews were killed in pogroms, many died on the front, and 300,000 Jewish orphans were counted. Many Jews immigrated from Russia at that time. The Jewish population of Moscow and St. Petersburg grew rapidly during the Civil War. For example, Moscow's population increased 
2.5 times from 28,000 to 86,000. In 1922, the Reds won the Civil War, marking the beginning of the USSR era. Between the 1917 revolution and the start of World War II, significant changes occurred in the life of the Soviet Jews. The revolution granted rights to Jews, but it didn't recognize Jews as a nation. According to Lenin and Stalin ideology, it did not meet the criteria defining a nation. Stalin declared that the nation is a historical community of people with a common culture, language, territory, and economy. Jews lacked such a common basis and, accordingly to the communist ideology, were to be assimilated with the people among whom they lived. In the early years following the October Revolution, there was a phenomenon of immigration of Jews from Western countries to the USSR. For example, in 1925, near Moscow, the labor commune Herold was organized. About 70 Jews from the USA and Canada lived there, were given land and tools for agriculture. However, the experiment failed. After only a year, more than half of the Jews had left. The failure was likely due to the well-read and intelligent Jews with left-wing views from developed Western countries accustomed to a good life under capitalism being unprepared for hard peasant work under Bolsheviks' rule, leading to disillusionment with ideas and return home. Later, a Bolshevik investigating the failure of the commune said, Unaccustomed to collective life, it causes irritability. In America, even the poorest segments of the population are individualized to the extreme. Soviet power, by destroying the old economic system deprived broad layers of the Jewish population of their sources of income and destroyed their economic base. Despite economic difficulties, the 1920s and the first half of the 1930s were a period of flourishing of Jewish culture, but not national culture, rather than international, communist culture. They intended to convey communist ideas to Soviet Jews in a language they understood, Yiddish. The communists created a special committee to solve the Jewish question in the USSR called Kamzet. Its main goal was to find and allocate lands for Jewish settlements. The communists ingeniously solved this problem of lands for Jews by simply exiling them to the far east of Russia. It's like suggesting that all American Jews relocate to Alaska to build their Israel. The communists aimed to kill two birds with one stone, solve the Jewish territory issue and develop the uninhabited Far East of the USSR, building a military industry there to protect the USSR's borders from the potential Chinese-Japanese threats. In 1930, the government adopted a resolution to create the Birabidjan National District in the Far East, and in 1934, the city of Birabidjan was established. I actually lived in the city for about four years when I was a teenager, and it was quite an interesting experience. High-ranking communist Kalinin envisioned the Jewish Autonomous Oblast as a national state for Jews within the USSR and a foundation for Jews worldwide. However, to realize this, Kalinin believed that at least 100,000 Jews should settle in this territory. Kalinin's dreams were not to be fulfilled. Despite many Jews arriving in Birabidjan from around the world due to rising global anti-Semitism, the Jewish population of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast never reached the desired 100,000 people. By 1939, only 18,000 Jews lived in the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, and by 1989, only 9,000 people, and by 2010, just 1,628. Why the Jewish project of the Soviet Union failed? The unbearable condition of the Far East, the severe cold, which was difficult for Jews relocated from Ukraine and Belarus to adapt to. The average January temperature in Jewish Autonomous Oblast is minus 24 degrees Celsius, which is minus 11 Fahrenheit. The main activity in the Jewish Autonomous Region was agriculture, but the climate was completely unsuitable, being too cold. And of course, Soviet policies toward Jews. In the 40s and 50s, persecutions of Jews began, which I will talk about a bit later. All the Jews simply left for Israel, because Israel even helped them with resettlement. By the way, I lived in Bidabijan for a couple of years during my school years, and one of the Israeli resettlement programs fully paid for the relocation of my classmates' family from Bidabijan to Israel. The history of Bidabijan is very interesting, and someday I will definitely make a whole video about it because I live there myself and have a lot to tell. Finally, in the USSR, restrictions on Jews receiving educations ceased to exist. Because of this, many Jews began actively pursuing education. However, in the late years of the USSR, percentage norms for Jews in universities were reinstated. The level of education among Soviet Jews was significantly higher than among Russians or Ukrainians. According to 1939 census, out of 1,000 Soviet Jews, 268.1 people had secondary education, and 57.1 had higher 
military education. Among Russians, accordingly to the same census, out of 1,000 people, only 6.2 people had higher education and 81.4 had secondary education. Thus, the proportion of people with secondary education among Jews was more than three times higher than among Russians. The gap was even wider in terms of the proportion of people with higher education. Nine times more Soviet Jews had higher education than Russians. In the Soviet universities, there were a significant number of Jewish students. In 1939, there were 98,216 Jewish students in the USSR's universities, which is 11.1% of the total number of students in the USSR. Especially, many Jewish students were in the largest city of the USSR, including those beyond the former Pale of Settlement. Thus, in 1939, Jews accounted for 17.1 of students in Moscow, 19% in Leningrad, known as St. Petersburg, 24.6% in Kharkiv, 35.6% in Kiev, and 45.8% in Odessa. However, the Jewish population in the USSR before 1939 was small, only 1.78% of all population. All Jewish political and cultural organizations in the USSR were completely destroyed in the 20s and 30s of the 20th century. Until 1938, Sovietized secular Jewish culture in Yiddish was encouraged as this language was spoken by the majority of Jews in the USSR in the first decades of the Soviet power. Yiddish culture was seen as a path to the Sovietization of Jews. In the mid 30s, when this goal was achieved and most Jews stopped observing Jewish traditions and switched to the Russian language in the Soviet way of life, Yiddish culture became unnecessary. In 1938, a campaign to win down Yiddish culture began. It primarily manifested in the closure of Jewish schools, colleges and technical schools and in the conversion of all educational institutions to Russian language. Interestingly, all this happened at the request of the quotes the Jewish workers as the Soviet press wrote. Simultaneously, the publications of newspapers and magazines in Yiddish were reduced and some Jewish theaters were closed too. However, the situation changed somewhat a year later. After the partition of Poland between Stalin and Hitler, the annexation of eastern Poland, western regions of Ukraine and Belarus nowadays, and part of Lithuania, and then the Baltic states, about 2 million Jews who had not undergone Sovietization became citizens of the USSR. Soviet propaganda once again restored to Yiddish culture, and actions against it were temporarily suspended. During World War II, the Soviets gave more freedom to Jews. The NKVD even created the Yiddish Anti-Fascist Committee, whose goal was to consolidate Jews around the world in aiding the USSR in the fight against Nazi Germany. For example, in 1943, prominent Soviet Jews, actor and director of the Jewish theater Salomon Michoels, poet Itzik Pfeffer, leaders of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, undertook a seven-month trip to the USA, Canada, Mexico and Great Britain. The purpose was to promote the efforts of the USSR in the fight against Nazism and to obtain material and moral support from Jews in these countries for the USSR. In the US, with the help of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, 16 millions of dollars were raised for the Soviet armed forces. Forces. 15 million of dollars were raised in Canada and Great Britain, 1 million of dollars in Mexico, and 750 thousand dollars in Palestine. Half a million of Jews served in the Soviet army during World War II fighting the Nazis. In World War II, from 1.5 millions to 2 million Soviet Jews were killed by the Nazis during the Holocaust. At the beginning of 1948, when World War II had ended and the useful functions of the Jewish anti-fascist committee from Stalin's and Beria's perspective had been fulfilled, the destruction of this organization began. On the night of January 12th to 13th, 1948, Solomon Michaels, the leader of the anti-fascist committee, was killed. Officially, it was announced that the actor was involved in an accident, but later it was revealed to the public that his murder was ordered by Stalin. After the creation of the State of Israel in May 1948, the situation worsened. The USSR, having voted in the UN on November 29, 1947, for the partition of Palestine, sincerely believed that Israel would be established as a socialist state under Soviet control. However, this did not happen. Moreover, from its first days, Israel established a strategic partnership with the US. Many Soviet Jews and the members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee welcomed Israel's first ambassador to the USSR, Golda Meir, when she arrived in the USSR on September 10, 1948. Due to sympathy of Soviet Jews towards Israel and Israel's ties with the US, Soviet officials began to suspect Soviet Jews and in particular the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee of dual loyalty or even betrayal 
betrayal of the Soviet system. The Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee was formally dissolved on November 20th, 1948, after which, in early 1949, most of its members were arrested. They were accused of disloyalty to the Soviet system, bourgeois nationalism, cosmopolitanism, and serving American interests. On August 12, 1952, 13 people, some of whom were major Jewish poets and writers such as Isaac Faber, Leib Kutko, Peres Markis, and others were executed. In total, 24 members of the Jewish anti-fascist committee died, some of them during torture before the trial and several dozens others were sent to camps and settlements. After Stalin's death, on November 22, 1955, the verdict against the member of the Jewish anti-fascist committee was overturned due to the lack of crime. In other words, Stalin had them killed without reason. However, the Ministry of the State Security of the USSR did not limit itself to the dissolution of the Jewish anti-fascist committee and the execution of its leadership. Along with this, a mass campaign called the fight against cosmopolitanism was unleashed in the country. Among historians, there is a dispute as to whether this campaign was specifically anti-Jewish, however, all agree that the majority of the victims of the campaign were indeed Jews, and one of the consequences was the rise of an open mind anti-Semitism at the state level. After the end of the World War II, a campaign to foster Soviet patriotism among the population began in the USSR. This was one of the steps to distance from the former Western allies. The central point was the assertion of the leading role of the great Russian people in the USSR. Very soon, the entire campaign turned into propaganda of Russian nationalism and imperialism. On August 6, 1946, the decree on the repertoire of drama theaters and measures for its improvement was adopted, following the same spirit. Similar resolutions were adopted regarding cinema. In 1947 to 1948, leading foreign magazines were removed from public access in libraries and sent to special storage. The USSR took a course toward cultural isolation. The term cosmopolitanism was introduced as the antithesis of the correct Soviet, that is, Russian patriotism. But in the summer of 1948, it became clear that the newly created state of Israel would not become Soviet, and against the background of the preparation for the destruction of the Jewish anti-fascist committee, the fight against cosmopolitanism gradually turned de facto into a fight against the Jewish intelligentsia. On February 8, 1949, Stalin signed a decree on the dissolution of all associations of Jewish Soviet writers and the closure of the newspapers Heimland, which means Homeland, and Der Stern which means the star. Following this, a number of Jewish writers and editors were arrested, both those associated with the Jewish anti-fascist committee and those not associated with it. Jewish museums, the Michael's Jewish Theater School, and all Jewish theaters were closed, as well as Yiddish radio broadcasts being stopped. Many of those arrested were accused of espionage for the USA, and some were executed. The campaign against the Cosmopolitans, even if it not initially conceived as specifically anti-Jewish, very quickly became so. As a result, anti-Semitism in the USSR intensified sharply, both at the state and everyday levels. Inspired by the commanding spirit from above, officials began to systematically dismiss Jews from their jobs. If the fight against cosmopolitanism could still be considered, at least initially, as not specifically anti-Jewish, the so-called doctor's plot was different. In the press, this case was called the case of the poisoner's doctors, but in investigation materials it was called the case of the Zionist conspiracy in the Ministry of State Security. The doctor's case began with Stalin being informed that medical specialist had confirmed the criminal treatment of Kremlin's leaders. On January 13, 1953, Pravda, which is a governmental newspaper, officially announced the arrest of a group of doctor saboteurs. The text specifically stated, most members of the terrorist group Wovsi, Kogan, Feldman, Grinstein, Ettinger and others were connected with the international Jewish bourgeois nationalist organization joined, allegedly created by the American intelligence to provide material assistance to Jews in other countries. These arrests of Jewish doctors led to a wave of anti-Semitic publications. A series of anti-Semitic cartoons and posters were published in the USSR. Anti-Semitism became in fact the official policy of the USSR. However, the anti-Semitic campaign in the press was suddenly curtailed on March 2nd 1953. On March 5, 1953, Stalin's death became known. On April 3rd of the same year, all those arrested in the doctor's case were released. The cases against them were closed and all were reinstated in their ranks and positions. 
The creation of Israel and the Six-Day War led to a rise in the national consciousness among Soviet Jews. Despite the fact that the USSR severed relations with Israel in 1967, in 1968 the KGB proposed allowing Jews to immigrate from the USSR. As you know, at that time living in the USSR was almost impossible, similar to North Korea nowadays. Eventually, in 1969, the USSR allowed Jews to immigrate and from 1969 to 1975, about 100,000 of repatriates from the USSR arrived to Israel. From the early 1980s, there was a decline in Jewish immigration to Israel. The USSR's policy on immigration became stricter, and most of those who left preferred the USA to Israel as a place of residence. During Perestroika, there was a rise in the national self-awareness among the peoples of the USSR, including Jews. There were also rumors of Jewish pogroms. For these reasons, many Jews from the USSR and later post-Soviet countries were interested in the repatriation programs to Israel from 1989 to 2004. During that period, more than 1.1 million of people moved to Israel. British historian John Clear writes, Cold War propaganda turned all Jews into a monolithic mass, Soviet Jewry, whose sole desire was salvation expected from the West. The interpretation of Jew status as victim of Soviet tyranny spread to their historical past, resulting in Jews of Tsarist Russia essentially being perceived only as passive sufferers. Interestingly, in the late USSR, Jews had fewer children than Russians. From 1988 to 1989, the total fertility rate in Jewish families was 1.56 children per family, while urban Russians had a rate of 2.03 children per family. Professor Moldechai Altschuler in his study Jews of the CIS on the threshold of the third millennium wrote, The overwhelming majority of Jews belong to the intelligentsia, which is characterized by low birth rates for Jewish women, and this is perhaps most important, a high level of education is typical, they strive to make a career. In the late USSR, there were still restrictions for Jews in obtaining higher education. For example, my favorite journalist, Ukrainian Dmitry Gardon, could not enter the journalism faculty in Kyiv during the Soviet era due to his Jewish ancestry. Modern Russia after the collapse of the USSR, life for Jews in Russia became relatively calm, but not completely. In 1994, the neo-Nazi group Legion Werewolf operated in Moscow, and its ideology consisted of the main tenets of German Nazism. Participants studied Hitler's Mein Kampf and prepared to fight against Jews, Communists and Democrats. The group adhered to neo-pagan ideas leaning towards the ideologies of German neo-paganism. It existed for several months and was dissolved by Moscow law enforcement in the summer of 1994. In 2001, 98 US senators wrote a letter to President Putin expressing concern about the growing popularity of anti-Semitism and radical extremism in Russia. Dear President Putin, we are writing to you as members of the United States Senate to again express our concerns over the anti-Semitic rhetoric heard at both the national and local levels of Russian society and politics. In years past, the US Senate had been united in its condemnation of such virulent anti-Semitism, which unfortunately has been present during much of Russia's history. Your remarks last year publicly condemning anti-Semitism assume special significance against the backdrop of centuries of Tsarist and Stalinist persecutions. We strongly encourage you to continue to publicly condemn anti-Semitism whenever it manifests itself in the Russian Federation. And the American senators are right. Just recently, November 2023, there was a pogrom in Dagestan, Russia. On the evening of October 29th, an aggressively minded crowd broke into Mahachkala's airport that same evening a regular flight from Tel Aviv had landed there. Information that the flight supposedly brought Israel refugees from the war in the Middle East had been spreading in local chats and telegram channels all weekend. As a result, hundreds of people gathered at the airport and first stormed the building, and then ran onto the airfield. Numerous videos from the scene show the rioters, among them men with Palestinian flags, searching the entire airport for Israel citizens and checking the passports of passengers. More than a thousand people participated in the riots. In addition, spontaneous anti-Semitic rallies took place in Mahachkalas and Karachay Cherkessia. In Cherkesk, a crowd at the administration building demanded not to let Israelis into the Republic. The life of Jews has never been easy. Starting in Rus with the advent of Christianity in the 10th century, 
persecutions of Jews as killers of Jesus Christ began. Later, during the reign of Moscow Tsardom, Ivan the Terrible expelled many Jews from conquered Lithuania and prohibited Jewish merchants from entering Moscow and other major cities. Under Peter the Great, a new layer of Jews emerged, baptized Jews who converted to Christianity just to avoid discriminations against Jewish people. Jews first began to hold high political positions in the Russian Empire under Peter the Great. However, after Peter's death and the rise to power of his wife, Catherine I, the policy towards Jews again tightened. Under Catherine the Great, the Pale of Settlement was created, which prohibited Jews from settling east of the territory of modern Ukraine and Belarus. Until the end of the Russian Empire, Jews were discriminated against by law, with constant new restrictions on where they could live, what they could trade, and rules of property rights constantly changing. That's why, during the Communist Revolution, most Jews supported the Communists who promised them equal rights with all other nations. However, the Communists did not fully keep their word. Anti-Semitism and the fight against Jewish intelligentsia began in the USSR under Stalin's rule with the fight against cosmopolitanism, the doctor's plot, all these are being episodes of anti-Semitism in the USSR. Until the end of the USSR, Jews could not freely enter universities and there were always percentage quotas on the number of Jews in the universities. Only after the collapse of the USSR, Jews began to live more freely in Russia, but anti-Semitism is still strong, especially in Muslim regions such as Dagestan. All this was a reason for the significant immigration of Jews from Russia and the USSR. A large part of Russian-speaking Jews now live outside the Russian Empire due to the immigrations of the 1970s and 1990s. According to 2021 census, 82,644 Jewish people lived in the Russian Federation, which constitutes to only 0.06% of the entire population. In the so-called Soviet Israel, the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, only 1,628 Jews live there nowadays. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to see more historical video on this channel, please let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget I have my Patreon page, and by supporting me on Patreon, you to support the work of this channel. As usual, I wish there is going to be freedom in Russia and peace in Ukraine. Bye.